not how good you are or how much you know, but really has a lot to do with who you know. There's just a lot of nepotism. So I said, well, you know, I find that really hard. So he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll get you a job at Fox in the mail room, and you can deliver the mail to the various department heads and see for yourself. Well, I lasted about six months, and I said to my dad, you were absolutely right. It's, it's certainly the hotbed of nepotism. So uh, I decided to go to a commentary school. And uh, so I graduated optometry school, and I went into his practice in Beverly Hills, but there was one problem. He had a very personalized practice, and his patients didn't want to see this 25-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sort of twiddled my thumbs for a little while, went out and covered other people's practices, and filled in, and pretty soon I came to the realization, hey, you know, you're pretty good at this. You could probably make it on your own. So at about that time, two gentlemen offered my father a rather generous amount for his practice, and he felt sort of guilty about doing it. And I said, Dad, take the money and run. I'll open up my own practice in Sherman Oaks. So I opened up my own practice in uh, Sherman Oaks, and uh, called everybody I knew in the movie business, and uh, all the head of the makeup departments, and said, you know, if you're looking for cosmetic contact lenses, here I am. And uh, so gradually, besides the regular practice, the cosmetic contact lens practice started to grow. And part of that was fitting people with disfigured eyes, which was an interesting part of the practice because I had this one lady from South America who had a, uh, a white cornea from a very bad infection, and she, they, they thought she was the devil. And uh, so we fitted her with a cover lens so that she didn't look like the devil anymore, and she was very happy. So uh, the first movie that I really was involved in was a movie called uh, Broken Arrow, and uh, the story here was that Deborah Padgett, who was a young actress, he, I don't know how many of you know who Howard Hughes is, but he was Howard Hughes' girlfriend at the time, and uh, she wanted this part opposite Jimmy Stewart, and Daryl Zanuck, the head of the studio, said, you can't have the part. You know, who ever heard of an Indian with blue eyes? So she came to me, and I gave her brown eyes, and she got the part. And she looked so good with brown eyes that she went on to play uh, a lot of biblical epics like uh, the uh, Ten Commandments and the greatest story ever told. In fact, she was in so many that we dubbed the color of her eyes biblical brown. Uh, but perhaps my greatest thrill was in 1960 when I got a call from the studio. They said they had this young actor and um, he was playing the part of the mother, uh, uh, his mother was a Kiowa Indian and his father was a rancher. So you know where that plot was going. And, but he had to have brown eyes. So I got to the studio and it was just the head of the makeup department, me and Elvis Presley. And that was very unusual because Elvis was always surrounded by a uh, retinue of people and there were hangers on and his uh, manager never allowed him really out alone. So I fitted Elvis with contact lenses to change him from blue to brown. And then he said, let's go to the commissary for lunch. And I said, that's very nice, don't mind if I do. So we went to the commissary for lunch and um, he told me about Deborah Paget, who was playing opposite in this. He sort of had a crush on her, and he said she wouldn't give him the time of day, and he never could figure it out because he was Elvis, you know. <laughs> and I said, I says, well, I said Elvis, you got to read the gossip columns because that's Howard Hughes' girlfriend. So, oh, 
Some of that. He says, <laughs> he says let's, uh, let's get the photographer here to take a picture, which he did, and it, I have a picture hanging in my, uh, my exam room. And uh, so that was a very pleasant interlude. And Elvis was a very nice person, a real gentleman, and it was a shame that he came to the end that he did. But uh, I guess that's show business. I had the pleasure of working with Audrey Hepburn in a movie called Wait Until Dark. Wait Until Dark was, uh, was adapted from a Broadway play in which she was a blind girl and she was uh, being harassed by two junkies. And uh, so she had to look blind but not grotesque. So we came up with a pair of contact lenses that, uh, that gave her that effect, and uh, she sent me a Christmas card every year after that, till she died, She's a very, very lovely person. And uh, then in 1968, they made a movie called Planet of the Apes. It's the original Planet of the Apes. And of course they had cast blue-eyed actors to play the apes. So every blue-eyed actor had to have brown contact lenses. And it was, it was really a difficult situation because the actors all wore these rubber masks and snouts and they couldn't blow their nose and they could only drink through a straw and then the mask was glued down around the eyes. And so we got to, had to get a contact lens in and not pull the mask loose. And uh, I really felt for the actors because they were very uncomfortable. And, uh, but the Planet of the Apes uh, turned out to be a, a big hit. <coughs> and uh, as you know, they made lots of other Planet of the Apes movies, over, under, instead of, and, et cetera. It's quite a successful franchise. And it's interesting, because the makeup artist I worked with on that movie, a fellow by the name of John Chambers, was uh, featured in a movie called Argo. Arco was a was a Ben Affleck movie about him uh, secreting a group of people out of Iran under the eyes of the Rue Revolutionary Guard, and John Chambers was one of the people that was involved in that. Okay, uh, in 1977, Dick Smith, who was considered like the dean of makeup artists. Uh, and he, I think he was called the, the father of special effects makeup, wanted to do a movie called The Exorcist. And I don't know how many of you have seen The Exorcist, but it was, it was quite, a, uh, quite a movie, and, and uh, there were dummies that could turn their head around, and uh, uh, dummies that could throw up uh, uh, pea soup. <laughs> So Dick and I sat down and we had to come up with a, a lens that we considered to be like the standard for vampires and exorcists and that sort of thing. So we came up with a design which was a yellow lens with a red uh, fringe on the edge and then a very light red fringe on the pupil. And we called that the exorcist lens. And we used that lens in lots of movies after that. And uh, in 1977, I was, I was contacted by uh, producer Ken Johnson, said he was making a new series called The Hulk. And he said he wanted some lenses that would show that, that Dr. Banner, who, if you're not familiar with The Hulk, he's the one that changes into The Hulk uh, if he's uh, provoked and he wanted some lenses that would show that uh, the change was about to take place. So we finally, we came up with white lenses with a green ring which matched the Hulk's green body makeup. And so if you ever see a, a Hulk episode, you'll see Dr. Banner and then his eyes turn white and then it turns into the Hulk. So uh, it was interesting because my wife and I went to see the the uh, screening of the Hulk at Universal, and I chuckled and I said, 
this is such junk, it will never amount to anything. <laughs> Which goes to show. <laughs> So in, um, in 1980, Rick Baker, who was the assistant to uh, Dick Smith and later became uh, a very decorated makeup artist on his own, came to me and said he wanted to make a movie it's called American Werewolf in London. So he wanted to do something different, something new. He wanted to do what was called a transformation. In other words, have the actor transform into a werewolf. And to do this, he had to uh, make rubber masks with air bladders and uh, whiskers that would come out and uh, quite a complicated makeup. And so we provided the lenses for, the, for that. There were werewolf lenses with uh, vertical pupils. And um, about a year later, Rick called me up and said, Mort, uh, Michael Jackson wants to do a, uh, he wants to do a transformation. And he says, this movie isn't going any place. He says, Michael just wants to dress up. You know? <laughs> so, so he says, uh, if he's willing to you know, pay for it, he says, I'm willing to do it if you'll make the lenses. So I said, well, you know, making the lenses is quite complicated. They're scoil lenses. And, they have to be painted, and they have to be weighted so that they don't rotate, so the pupil stays vertical, etc. And uh, so he says, well, Mort, I'd really appreciate it if you do this as cheaply as possible, because this is only for Michael's edification, and it's never going anywhere. <laughs> and I believed him. <laughs> and uh, so we did Michael Jackson for the largest selling video of all time. <laughs> and it was, it was interesting, because I didn't find this out until recently, because I was feeling sorry for Rick Baker, but what he did was took all the outtakes of the makeup test where he was making the uh, mold of the face and, uh, and the uh, air bladders, and um, put it together in something called The Making of Thriller which he then sold for a lot of money. And I'm in the making of Thriller, putting Michael's lenses in. I'd say, look up, Michael, look down. <laughs> but uh, Michael was not really very happy with the lenses because the particular scene from Thriller was shot in Griffith Park on a night when it was windy and it was blowing a lot of dust. And uh, that is not good. <laughs> and. Uh, so we've always maintained that uh, if the actor is uncomfortable and he says the lenses have to come out, they have to come out because we certainly don't want to cause a corneal abrasion. So Michael kept saying, oh, the lenses are burning like Tapasco, you gotta take them out. And the director <laughs> kept saying, one more take, one more take. So finally we got the lenses out and fortunately we didn't get an abrasion, but uh, from that time on, we always had a technician on the set who is responsible directly to me. And if she thinks the lenses have to come out, 